Welcome to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast, episode number 79. Hey there, everyone. How's it going? Welcome to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast, episode number 79. My name is Chris Chillingworth. Hope you are doing well. Thank you so much for tuning in. This week, uh, I wanted to just kind of briefly talk a little bit about what we're up to. Also, I want to talk about what we look for in companies. I think it would be of, of some use to some people because we're always getting new members and, and, and new listeners coming into the show. I talked about this a while back in previous episodes, but um, I think it's time to maybe revisit and um, talk about this particular subject in a bit more detail in terms of what I look for in companies. the uh, This week, we've been I've been really busy in getting uh, analysis done on UK companies. So if you've listen to the show before you'll know that part of my role of what I do is I run a, a membership club um, for retail investors around the world we've got members from all over the place and these are typically you know everyday retail investors that, that invest in their stocks and shares ISAs and SIPs and stuff like that and uh, they want to know what stocks to buy but they just they just don't know they don't know how to tell the difference between one from the other and so that's where I come in because I my full-time job is to analyze companies and find the best businesses to invest in and also just as importantly which ones to leave well alone you know uh, and, and this has enabled us to navigate not necessarily perfectly because there have been companies that were doing great and then some unpredictable thing came along that kind of unsteadied the ship a little bit um, but it's allowed us to stay well well clear of companies that all the warning signs were there things weren't looking good for a long time and it's typically the case that when a company does badly and falls you know goes into administration or whatever um, the warning signs were there years before it happened and you know we, in some cases 10 years of decline before the media and everyday people heard about it uh, and and we this enables us to stay well clear of those companies and um, and make sure we don't lose all our money invested in the wrong businesses basically, and so part of that role is to analyse these these companies. I have found uh, a, a number of companies that I have handpicked that I love that I that are, that are geared towards doing well in the future. Um, we're looking at ten to twenty year outlooks. So we're not necessarily expecting to be <clears throat> to make huge returns in the first or second year. These are how much are these companies going to be worth in 10, 20 years if they carry on doing what they've been doing? And you can forecast that and, and you can see that some of these companies are going to be dramatically bigger than where they are now based on th what they're up to right now, that based on their growth strategies, what they're working on, how much profit they're making, how much of that profit they're reinvesting back into their business into these strategies and so I, I go through these companies I find the ones I love once I have found the companies I like then it's, it's kind of like a maintenance process where every year that company is going to release an update in, in the likes of their annual report and it gives us an opportunity to get a glimpse into their financials uh, they're completed financials because quarterly updates are skewed and not necessarily particularly useful to work off because uh, you're only getting a quarter of the year's information and this might be a company that do better in the winter than in the, the spring and so uh, or events might happen and so it's better to take a instead of being getting so close in I like to take a step back and just look at things from a yearly perspective sometimes even that's too close but I like to take a step back and look at a year by year perspective that gives me a better idea of where is this company going in relation to where it's been and once I once I have found these companies, we, we look at these annual reports every year and we look at the financials to make sure that everything is still hunky-dory there and we like what we see. But also, how is the growth strategy going? Are they still aiming for what they were aiming for before, if that makes sense? You know, they have these five-year growth strategies, but two years in, a new CEO comes in and says, we're going to do this instead, you know? And so... We have to keep on track of that and make sure, you know, has thing, have things changed? Are they on track? Does this all look good? Are they hitting the numbers they said they were going to hit? Or are they doing better? Um, how is the pilot scheme in Germany going? Does this look like it's growing? Is it see? Are we seeing the same sort of numbers that they saw when they first started up in the UK? Or 
when they expanded into France, how quickly did it grow? Are we seeing the same sort of growth in Germany or is this better or is this worse? Um, if so, can we therefore use what happened in France as a, like a kind of five year forecast for where things are going to go in Germany? What would that do to the overall revenue of France, UK and all the other avenues they've got? That sort of thing is what we're doing, what we're looking at. And believe it or not, there are 12 companies releasing updates in this very month and it has been busy 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 for me because there have been months obviously in the year where no companies are releasing any updates none of the companies that we love are releasing any updates in that month and so that's when I tend to go and work on other projects such as we're working on doing the same thing that we've done for the UK stocks on the US stocks uh, and the slow going because it takes uh, a back seat to what we're doing in the UK. But as the membership grows, I'm getting to a position now where I'm, I'm really close to hiring another assistant. And that will enable us to perhaps get the US stuff moving a bit quicker. But for now, as it stands, my priorities on the UK companies, the UK watch list, that's where everything started for this. Uh, it's what I'm heavily invested in myself. And then in my spare time, when things are a bit quieter in the UK and that's when we work on the US stuff but it's been very much a UK focus this week because of the fact we've got 12 companies releasing updates in the same month um, and I've managed to get through three of those companies in fact we've got I did three last week I've done three this week and we're down I think we've got it down to five companies now left to look at um, but we're going to have a few more in April so it's going to boost that back up again to I think we've got another four or five in April to look at so we're going to be back to sort of 9 or 10, but after April, things get a little bit quieter in May. They pick up again in June, July, and then they get quieter again for a while. So, uh, and then I think it's August, September, a couple more companies, and then after September, it gets really quiet. So, yeah, um, been working heavily on getting those updates, and, and essentially what that involves is uh, reading through the entire annual report of a fine tooth comb, to extracting all the information that really makes a difference, and and ignoring what is probably ninety percent fluff. You know, I don't care about their the, the company's um, environmental pledges. You know, I mean, it's good that they're doing that sort of thing, but. 20 pages of their annual report is all about what they're going to do to help reduce carbon emissions and I care about that in so much that I think it's a good thing I think businesses should be doing it but it doesn't make any direct impact on what I'm looking for it's not the information I'm looking for right now and so I will go through those reports and I've done oh, how many companies have I looked at I've looked at a thousand UK companies uh, and 50 US companies I've looked at 10 years of reports per company plus some because some of them I've looked at 15 years worth of annual reports most of them I go back to 2008 onwards we're now at 2024 so we're looking at 15 years per company so I'm looking at probably looking at have, having read 15,000 annual reports probably that's what I've done and these are typically 100 to 200 page documents and so in in doing that I have learned what I'm looking for and where to find it in the quickest possible, most efficient time. <laughs> and so I'll go through an annual report and I'll go, I'll, I will skip through the director's remuneration details. You know, what directors own, how many shares and how have they, what bonuses have they received and stuff. I don't care about that sort of thing. I care in so much that it's important to just keep an ear to the ground on that sort of stuff, but it doesn't make direct impact on what I'm looking for. And so uh, I, I, I've learnt now how to navigate these annual reports in the quickest, most efficient way possible. Uh, and I can I can do it relatively quickly. And so I'll go through these reports like I did this week. I've gone through three different annual reports this week on three different stocks that we love. And I have then gone into what we have as a PDF, which is a four to five page PDF that goes into fine detail on the key stuff that matters you know, I'm not sending a PDF on the company's environmental pledges uh, or the community work that they've done in their local area. Yeah, that's not in the reports. What's in the reports is the stuff that my clients, my members and I myself need to know about this company to make an informed decision on whether to invest or not. 
And so I've been putting those reports together. They've gone out to their client to the clients this week. Uh, so we've done three of those reports. We've improved those reports and added a load more data this week on pricing because uh, our pricing analysis was thorough, but the reports didn't reflect the thoroughness of those uh, of that analysis. And so the price analysis section was about half of one page. And in fact, it was probably about a quarter of one page and uh, didn't go into a huge amount of detail. We've changed that based on member feedback and that now we have a, an entire page of the report with graphs and trajectories and forecasts and all this kind of stuff on on what the facts suggest is going to happen with these prices and what the facts show us right now. Are we getting good value for our money right now? Uh, and in addition to that, are we likely to get good value for our money if we buy now and the company continues where it's going over the next five, ten years? In other words, would you be willing to slightly overpay for a stock now because in 10 years' time, it would have turned out to have been a, an amazing deal. Uh, and so we put all that in the reports as well, and, and, and that's what I've been working on. Um, we are finding, through looking at these companies, uh, as a natural you know, result of the work that I do looking at these companies, we're finding that many stocks that we love, that are very healthy companies doing wonderful work, are having a, a negative 2023. So the results that are coming out of these wonderful, wonderfully run stocks are poorer than they were in 2022. And this has caused some of my members to be concerned, not worried, but concerned. Like, oh, this doesn't, this isn't as good. This is a real shame, you know. Uh, I I don't react in that way because I've been doing this for a while now. But many of the beginners who come in they see these poorer results you know 2023 results at 50 percent the level of profit they made the year before and they think oh god but these are not things that i am particularly worried about um and this is because i have a, a probably a better wider understanding of this particular company and where it's going and i see it as my responsibility to be able to educate and inform those beginners as to why i'm not worried about that sort of thing um, and this is largely driven in 2023 or has been largely driven because of a what a lot of companies are referring to as a de-stocking knock-on effect. And what this means is that when the pandemic hit in 2020, over 2020, 2021 and 2022, what a lot of companies did is they went crazy and like double, triple, quadrupled up on their inventory because they were worried about things like supply chain issues, not being able to serve their customers was their business. All these companies around the world were focused on themselves as in what's going to damage our business. Well, if we can't deliver product to our customers, that's going to be a nightmare. So we need to get in our product. Uh, we need to have store, store warehouses full to the brim so that over the next couple of years of uncertainty, because we don't know what's going to happen with this pandemic, we can still serve our clients, we can still serve our customers and, and send this product out or whatever. Perhaps it's a manufacturing thing, we need to be able to manufacture this stuff and if we don't have the parts, we're not going to be able to manufacture it. So they, they just doubled up, quadrupled up on all their, their stock, which is fine. And what we, taught, what we saw then as a knock-on effect of that in 2020 and 2021 was that 2022 was a fantastic, profitable year for many stocks. Many of the companies that we love, out of the, the ones that I've handpicked, had glorious 2022s. Record revenues, record profits. It was really healthy. Um, and what we're seeing now in 2023 is the knock-on effect of that. Because what's happening now, or what has happened in 2023, is that the companies that we love have found their sales have dropped significantly, like 50%, 30% here and there. They found revenues have fallen 10, 20, 30% because of this destocking effect. Because what's happened is their clients, their clients, aren't buying as much from them anymore. They're choosing to use what's in the storehouses. They're choosing to use the existing inventory. They're not buying as much anymore because they don't need to. 
they can just work out of the big surplus that they have in house another reason they're doing that as well is because prices have jumped higher inflationary pressures inflation's gone up higher energy costs costs are going up and so if you've got a num- uh, some some product in a warehouse that you bought for 10 pounds or you can go and buy it today brand new from the supplier for 12 pounds you're not going to do that you're going to use the supply that you have in house that you bought for cheaper before this energy increase and inflationary pressures before your suppliers put their prices up the stock that you bought on the at a cheaper price is the stock you're going to sell first um <clears throat> because by the time you get through that maybe the outside prices have gone back down again and so it doesn't make any sense to buy now at higher prices when you've got stock in there that you bought for cheaper and so that's what's happening and so a lot of the companies from the watch list from the stocks that I've picked not all of them but a fair I'm seeing a, a, a certainly a trend and a pattern here is that we're looking at these companies they're, they're reporting poorer 2023s or because of destocking or because the people that buy off them are now buying less in 2023 because they've already got full warehouses and they just think there's no point and this has caused a, a, a drop in profits you know, on top of that, obviously, the inflationary pressures and the energy costs have also increased expenses for a lot of these companies. So not only are they seeing lower sales, but they're seeing higher costs of running their business, which obviously results in lower profits. It's absolutely going to, and it's always going to be the case. And the market always expected this would be the case. But if you aren't aware of this sort of stuff, and let's say you're a beginner to invest in, you don't know about any of this, you're just going to see the headlines that profits have fallen 30% from previous year and think, oh God, that's terrible. I need to get out. Or, you know, and the share price has fallen as a result. Well, I definitely need to get out of this. And that's not what we're doing. We're seeing it as part of a wider picture. We're taking a step back and going, sure, this has happened. Cool, fine. It's not great. It's not what we wanted out of the companies that we invest in as shareholders. But... It is a bump in the road on a wider journey. It is a 10 to 20 year process we are looking at. 10 to 20 year journey, a uh, uh, view of this whole thing. And so, of course, there are going to be bumps along in the road. Of course, there are going to be years where profits drop a little bit. There are going to be Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have talked. Uh, rest in peace, Charlie Munger. Um, has talked, they've talked extensively in their interviews about how in their time of being legendary investors that made billions and billions just through investing in 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 the way that they did they talk about how six or seven occasions their portfolios fell by 50 percent in value because of events that happened around the world pandemics and, and other things talking about 50 year career I suppose in investing there where their portfolios have fallen quite considerably in value and what did they do did they run to the hills and sell 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 and and exit the market no they understood that these events happen that they are not a time to sell because why would you sell your assets at the cheapest possible price they are a time to be patient and just wait for the recovery and if Deals are now suddenly good because they're cheap. It's the time to buy more. And that's what they did. The trick is knowing which stocks to buy more in and which stocks to leave well alone. When you're in a situation where prices have gone down because profits are down or because there's a wide... It's not because the company are doing anything bad. It's the wider global economy or it's an event that's happened that's affected every company, every stock. In those times when share prices are pushed down, that's when you need to know what you should be buying and what you should be leaving alone. Because if you make the right decisions at that point, if you know the healthy companies that are going to easily outlive this event and do very, very well in the recovery period, which will come, then you can buy with confidence. You can buy stocks at a cheaper price with real confidence because you know this is a bargain you know this stock is going to be worth you don't know how much it's going to be worth i can't tell you what a stock's going to be worth in 10 years time i have no idea 
but I can tell you it is very likely that this stock is going to be worth a heck of a lot more money in 10 years time if they can to continue the the trajectory that they are on the progress that they have been making if they carry on doing what they're doing and that's what the yearly checks are for to make check make sure okay we love this stock it's going to be worth a lot more money in 10 years time certainly in 20 years time but let's just keep an eye on things every year to make sure that they're still on track for that and that's what we do that's what i do and so this event, whilst it's negative, and a few of my members, the more the more the beginners are, I wouldn't say they're worried, but they they'll you know mention they're a bit concerned about it. Perhaps um, it's my responsibility to try and try and educate my members in that way and explain that this isn't anything to be stressing over. It's not a big deal. These events happen. There's a reason for this. It's not because the company are doing badly it's not because people don't want their product anymore it's not because there's a um a destabilizing threat that's come along you know a disruptive technology that's going to completely destroy them it's not because of those reasons there's a reason for this and the reason is because this is a knock-on effect of the behaviors of companies during the pandemic when they massively overstocked and now they're just going through that stock and as a result the massive reward these companies received in 2022 in selling double the amount of product they normally sell well which was actually 2021 but they saw the effects of that in terms of the profit in 2022 and then in 2022 2023 companies then suddenly stopped buying because the pandemic ebbed away and now they're left of all this product that they didn't actually need and they're going to go through that. And so for the reward in 2022 comes the, the suffering of, of that reward in 2023. And if you were to balance the two out, if you were to take the excess profit they made in 2022 and give it to 2023, you'll see it's completely balanced in most cases. You look at the company's financials, they, pay, they soared in 2022 and then they dropped off a cliff almost in 2023. And if you were just to give the surplus of 2022 to 2023, you'd find actually the graph looks really balanced and actually things look great. They're just on a, a decent continued trajectory to growth. Um, and that is why I look at this and think that's not something I'm concerned about. I'm not worried. They say a lot of these companies are saying 2024 is going to be... Uh, a similar year to 2023 based on what they can see now and based on you know you can only make a decision based on the information that's presented in front of you and at the moment a lot of these companies are saying we're expecting 2024's results to be very similar to 2023's because there's still instability there's still this destocking issue a lot of companies are increasing their purchases now they're or they're finding that you know that sales are improving um, but it's slow, gradual growth, and it probably won't be till 2025 that we start to see a real nice return to profit. Knowing this information, you can invest with confidence. You can invest thinking, well, I understand why you know, the, the, the results aren't as good. The market has reacted negatively because it always does. It's like a child. If there's some bad news that comes out or it's negative, Regardless of the context, the market will panic. The market is like a, um, a a dramatic guy running around the office screaming, we're all going to die, we're all going to die. That's how I picture, you know, this kind of the Mr. Market, as Warren Buffett used to describe this um, hypothetical, theoretical um, character. And this is what the market is like. So when profits are announced at being down 20%, you, the market is basically we're all gonna die uh and for a level-headed investor that understands the stock that has done his research and knows what he's talking about he or she i should say looking at these companies you can make an informed decision you can say i get why it's down it's not going to go on forever in that case they will return back to their normal trajectory of growth i'm sure that these inflationary pressures and the wider economy will improve eventually. Uh, there are signs of it improving already with energy prices starting to fall down, inflation slowing down, uh, and things are looking like they are going to slowly. It's going to take time, it's going to take years, 
but it will slowly start to get back to some sort of normality. Um, and we're seeing, you know, having reached a peak, we're starting to see it return back to better level levels. And so we're starting to see those signs and businesses are starting to see revenues increase again in early 2024. Some of them are saying that the first quarter of 2024 is looking more healthier than what we saw in 2023. That's an encouraging sign. And you would expect, an investor like myself would expect, that over the next few years, things are going to get better. Things are going to improve. And when you read the annual reports from experts in their field, the, whose job it is to, to do this sort of work... They're all saying, we are preparing now for the recovery. We are putting work in now for when things get better. You know, housing companies are buying land bank so that by the time that the market recovers and there are tons of first time buyers, they've got all this land they can use to buy, to, to build new homes, to to provide for that. Uh, many of the companies that I invest in are adding more warehouses they're doing that because they know that when the recovery comes, they're going to be called upon to deliver more capacity, more products going to be needed. They're going to be needing more storage space. And so they're investing millions into building more storage facilities to increase capacity. They're upgrading their factories to increase capacity, to increase what they can churn out every year. These are positive signs because the companies are investing millions into this stuff. Because they have a very strong belief that they are going to be rewarded for doing so. Companies, if they thought that the future didn't look good, they wouldn't be investing for the future. They're investing in for the future now because they believe that things are going to improve. When you see this across multiple companies, it adds more weight. It adds more credibility to that opinion. You're seeing this across 30 different annual reports from companies that you love, who companies that have delivered for the last 15 years and done wonderful jobs. They've navigated the financial crisis of 2009 particularly well and survived it and did well. They've dealt with the pandemic really well. And they're telling you, we're investing in the future because we're expecting a, a recovery sort of 2025, 2026. And it's like, okay. But when you're seeing that across... All the companies that you love that have great track records and many of these board members are saying the same thing. It can give you that confidence to say, OK, it sounds like we're, we're not expecting a huge spike, although that could happen. But what we are expecting is that maybe we've seen the bottom. Maybe it's it's looking more and more like we have seen the bottom of prices and that we could be in the recovery phase right now. We, and this is the thing with the stock market. You don't know what phase you're in and you can't know what phase you're in. And it's only until you look over your shoulder at five years before that you can say, ah, we were in the recovery five years ago. Because <laughs> uh, it's hugely lagged. You've got no way of knowing where you are right now. And so you can only do it in hindsight, which isn't particularly useful but we could 100% be, I mean, you look at a price of a stock right now, I, for example, there's a stock that was at £6 probably last year, now at, now at 8 or £9 a share right now, and will that stock see £6 again? And I'm looking at these companies and thinking, probably not. And... Over the next few years, we may well see that that share price goes up to 11, 12, 13 pounds, you know, over the next decade, maybe 14 pounds on that stock. And then one day there'll be another crash. One day there'll be another event that causes the stock market to crash. But will it go down all the way back down to six or will it drop to like eight? In the context of the last couple of years, that would be a disastrous fall. But if you take a big step back and you look at the last 10, 20 years of this stock, well, that's nothing close to where it fell last time during the pandemic of 2020. And this is what we typically tend to find with wonderful performing stocks over long periods of time. They go up, they fall, then they go, they recover, they go up higher than they were before. Then at some point they fall again, but they don't fall to the same depths as they did the first time. And it's like the teeth of a saw. And you look at these, these charts and you see there are definitely drops along the way. Big drops. In, in the context of just looking at a couple of years worth of this stock, 
humongous drops that would cause investors to, you know, wet their pants. <laughs> but then the, the stocks always recover. Look at the charts. Look at the charts of the last 20, 30 years of a stock that has done well, that has grown thousands of percent. You'll see, yeah, this stock has grown tremendously. I wish I owned this stock 15 years ago. I'd be rich today kind of stock. But you will definitely see, if you look closely, there are some significant drops along the way. And when you understand the grander, broader picture, you don't worry about those drops. Because as long as the underlying business you're invested in are doing everything right, are making wonderful profits, and in their bad years are still making 10% profit, for example, which is commonly the case with a lot of companies we're invested in, you know that you are in one of these businesses, you're in, you're invested in one of these stocks that does well over 20, 30 years, you know, the share price grows astronomically, and you're probably just in one of those little dips, and it's going to be okay. You can only get that confidence from analysis. You will, if you do not understand analysis, if you do not know how to analyze that stock, if you don't know what you're invested in, with, with a, a certain degree of detail, then you can never have that confidence that this stock is going to keep going. And in knowing the business, it makes investing so much more fun. Because these events don't worry you so much. Because you can look at companies like this and say, you know what, I understand what's going on. This isn't going to last forever. This is a knock-on effect of the extra profit they made in 2022. I'm not concerned. I'm going to carry on buying more. And because the stock market has reacted poorly, and we've seen 20% off the share price, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for us to be able to buy more shares than we could have done had this, this the market not reacted in that way, if that makes sense. I would have bought shares in this company anyway, but now I'm getting 20% off, even better. And if I'm getting 20% off, if I was going to spend a thousand quid on shares, I'm still going to spend a thousand quid on shares. It just means I get more shares for my money. And that's a good thing. So, but you've got to know the right businesses to invest in. I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I hope that it's been a useful episode and giving you some food for thought at least. Uh, and maybe got you to think a bit more about, you know, if you've been worrying about your investments, if you've been worrying about the performance of your stocks, uh, this may be what's going on. It may be a destocking effect. And um, yeah, if you've got any questions at all, you can email me. I apologize for not responding to any emails this week. I've been so busy with analysis that I have completely let my email slip. So if you emailed me in the last week and I haven't replied, I'm not being rude. I'm not ignoring you. I just haven't had time this week, but I'm going to jump on it next week. You can email me at chris at chrischillingworth.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at C-H-R-I-S-C-H-I-L-L-I-N-G worth.com. That's my email address. You can also hit my website, chrischillingworth.com. Uh, on the website, you'll find blog articles. There is a link to... Uh, information about the, the investment club that we run. We're not taking on any members at the moment, but you can find out some more information about what's going on there if you so wish. Uh, there is links to this podcast. There's links to my books. Uh, there's links to information about the, the kids' investment club that we're running uh, and all sorts of information. And eventually, I'm going to be talking about my, my board game on there as well, which is in playtesting and is going remarkably well. We literally we had a playtest yesterday, free player playtest with some friends uh, in the industry and we started at 8 p.m. and we played the game they played the game for the first time and as soon as we finished they were like do you want to play again so that's a really good sign uh, and then we played a third time but their choice so it's and it's rare that you dig out a board game that you want to play three times in a row so I think we're on to something and it's really exciting we tur I turned I won the third game, turned 4K into £126,000 in nine years. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a cool game. It's, and it's it's fleshing out. There's more being added to it, more layers, making it more exciting. We're putting world events into it that have a knock-on effect to all the stocks and all this kind of stuff. It's going to be a really good, really good game. Um, very, 
very much relevant to what I do because it's all about investing in stocks, navigating the markets. These world events happen where a destocking of of products happens or there's a shortage of semiconductors and these things will have knock-on effects to the share prices of these stocks in addition to the core mechanics of the game. They add another layer onto the game. And then the players have to try and navigate and make as much money from the stock market as they can within and amongst those 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 events. So, um, yeah, we played it three times yesterday and I came away with 21 different notes of changes and ideas and additions and things that would just enhance the game and make it far more fun to play. And, yeah, uh, we're on to something. So... We will carry on playtesting this and then eventually I'm going to do some videos on it showing people what we've got so far, uh, invite some other people to throw some ideas in if it needs it. But um, yeah, uh, so stay tuned. If you're interested in the development of that game, then just stay tuned to the podcast and I will let you know when we start doing some some videos that we're going to chuck up on YouTube at some point and they'll probably go up on the website too. But thank you so much for listening. I hope it's been interesting. Next week, we're going to have an update because we will be through March, so we'll have a March update on my personal portfolio, which would be cool. So, uh, yeah, thanks for listening, and I'll see you guys next week. Cheers.